Welcome to Sunday evening Bible study. We're continuing our studies in the book of Revelation. Tonight our scripture is Revelation 16, verses 8 and 9. We'll be looking at the fourth bowl of God's wrath. The Bible says, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. The first three bowls of wrath were poured out on misconceptions of the church. This fourth bowl of wrath is poured out on the fundamental basis upon which Jesus built his church. We now find the everlasting gospel poured out on the Son, which we have learned is the New Testament. So is God angry with the New Testament? No. His judgment is poured out on mankind's misuse of the New Testament to promote his own causes and to further his own religious will. The New Testament is a book that when not used under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, people can selectively interpret and form their own doctrines that support their particular prejudices. It is in this sense that much of what professes to be the church has actually lost sight of what the gospel is and what it does in the lives of people. As misconceptions in the church are proliferated, it now becomes necessary for the Holy Spirit to intervene through this bowl of wrath and call people back to the everlasting gospel without holding back. As the everlasting gospel is clarified, God's called ministry uses that clarified gospel to scorch men with fire that God used to clarify the gospel for them. The word scorch appears several times in the New Testament under its forms. And the first appearance of that word is in the parable of the four kinds of ground uh, that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 and 8, and also Mark chapter 4, verses 3 and 8. Jesus said some people are like stony ground. You remember that from what he taught us? That means that they are shallow and lack commitment to the gospel. These stony people are people that at first receive the gospel with joy. And this is probably because they've been troubled by guilt, and then they hear of the possibility of forgiveness. They then make an emotional response to God's idea of forgiveness, or their idea of God's forgiveness, I should say. And perhaps they even confess their sins and ask God to forgive them. But there is no real repentance in their begging forgiveness. They imagine they are pardoned, and from that they have some temporary peace and joy. Well, Jesus says of these stony people that they have no root in themselves. Their sense of pardon is really wishful thinking. That's all it is. Because there was no repentance, the new birth did not take place in their lives, and they did not receive the Holy Spirit of God. Consequently, they have no real love for Jesus. They see him as a, a good buddy. They don't really see him as a savior to be served and to be obeyed. And because there was no real moral and spiritual change, their moral compass is still set on the flesh, and is drawn to the flesh and sin. This fourth bowl says the sun scorches them, or I should say the parable Jesus taught says the sun scorches them because in the inevitable time of temptation, they have no moral and spiritual strength to resist it, and they give in and return to sinning. So the object of this fourth bowl of God's wrath is the church that allows and expects this to be the standard for salvation under the gospel. <clears throat> so, what is the gospel about? Well, 
an angel, the angel that appeared to Joseph in the book of Matthew introduces the gospel to us with the conception of Jesus Christ. The angel assures Joseph that the conception is an act of the Holy Spirit so that the babe born of Mary is truly God incarnate. That's where it starts. <clears throat> he tells Joseph the son to be born to her is to be called Jesus. And the name Jesus is significant because it is the same word as Savior. Jesus means Savior. Savior is the word Jesus. <clears throat> Barnes emphasizes the significance of the name and the angel's statement that he shall save. This expresses the same as the name. And on this account, the name was given to him. He saves men by having died to redeem them, by giving the Spirit to renew them, by his power in enabling them to overcome their spiritual enemies, in defending them from danger, in guiding them in the path of duty, in sustaining them in trials and in death. And he will raise them up at the last day and exalt them to a world of purity and love. I just think that it's a beautiful expression of everything that that name Jesus and Savior means to us. In Matthew 121, the angel says that Jesus will save his people from their sins. Barnes again drives the point home in unmistakable words. He writes, this is the great business of Jesus in coming and dying. It's not to save men in their sins, but from their sins. Sinners could not be happy in heaven. It would be a place of wretchedness to the guilty. The design of Jesus was, therefore, to save from sin. First, by dying to make an atonement. And second, by renewing the heart and purifying the soul and preparing his people for a pure and holy heaven. I like to quote from Barnes an awful lot. I have his entire <coughs> commentary. <coughs> and as you've uh, heard me quote from him over the years, uh, you may think, well, he was probably a, a Nazarene or a Church of God minister. Well, Barnes was a Presbyterian minister. <laughs> Presbyterian minister in the mid-19th century. And he says, uh, it goes on to say that we learn three things from this declaration he just stated. First, that Jesus had a design in coming into the world. He came to save his people. And that design will surely be accomplished. It is impossible that in any part of it he should fail. Do you agree with that? Jesus saves. Jesus does not fail. Second, we have no evidence that we are his people unless we are saved from the power and dominion of sin. And this is a Presbyterian minister saying this. Let me say that again. Do you agree with this statement? We have no evidence that we are his people unless we are saved from the power and dominion of sin. A mere profession of being his people will not answer. Unless we give up our sins, unless we renounce the pride, pomp, and pleasure of the world and all our lusts and crimes, we have no evidence that we are the children of God. It is impossible that we should be Christians if we indulge in sin and live in the practice of of any known iniquity. Can you say amen to that? That's powerful. That's truth. And then three, that all professing Christians should feel that there is no salvation unless it is from sin and that they can never be admitted to a holy heaven hereafter unless they are made pure by the blood of Jesus here. What Barnes wrote here, most certainly, is this bowl of God's wrath that scorches with great heat. I will tell you this. Very few ministers would dare to preach any one of these three points to their people, let alone preach them all. John the baptizer 
picks up on the saving work of Jesus when Jesus came to be baptized. He declares in first, uh, John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As the Lamb of God, Jesus bears the sin of the world by living a human life and dying on the cross to make atonement for the sin of all mankind. So, does the salvation Jesus made possible take away our sins? Or does it only purchase forgiveness for our sins? The Apostle John answers this question in 1 John 1, 7, where he says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. One wonderful truth we learn from this statement is that there is no sin, no matter how wicked or despicable, that cannot be forgiven and cleansed from the sinner's record. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Think of the worst and most horrible thing a person could do, yet God will forgive because Jesus made atonement for that sin. The second truth is the truth of justification that having repented and placed faith in the atonement in Christ, a person's record of past sins is abolished and he stands before God as if he had never sinned. That is a powerful truth. That is a powerful reality. Now, among modern-day fundamentalists, it's believed that the cleansing from all sin includes not only past sins, but includes present sins and all future sins. It is held by some that at a moment a person is saved, all his future sins are covered by the blood of Christ. Well, they go on to say it is inevitable that people will continue to sin, and those sins are covered by the blood of Christ before they are committed. So, and they're thinking, a person should ask forgiveness as he commits sin. But if he does not, the sin is still forgiven and under the blood of Christ. How many here have ever heard that taught? Okay, I have heard it taught in a church. I won't say what kind of church. But there are people that this is really what they believe. And this is what they're holding on to for their salvation. They feel uh, really no reason not to commit a sin if it's convenient for them to do so. Well, let's ask our 19th century Presbyterian minister friend, Albert Barnes, to comment on the cleansing from all sin. He says, Christ's religion requires that all his friends should resemble him by their walking in the light. We should look like Jesus. Basically, well, that's what that word Christian means. It means little Christ, okay? I ask you, honestly, answer me. Does continual sinning sound like bearing a resemblance to Christ? Did Jesus continue sinning? Well, did Jesus ever sin? Well, we are to resemble Christ by walking in the light. Then he says, provision was made in his religion for cleansing the soul from sin and making it like God. No system of religion intended for man could be adapted to his condition which did not contain this provision. In other words, to be salvation, it truly has to cleanse us from sin and make us like God. So does what Barnes wrote or what the Bible says resemble the modern gospel in any way? You know, in churches around us, there are very sincere and dedicated ministers that will get up and they will preach good messages, pretty messages, encouraging messages. But you know, they never really dig into the depth of the gospel. They always try to, you know, make you feel good 
Uh, you know, hey, you're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. You're going to mess up from time to time. Don't look back. Look forward. Keep trusting. Hey, you know, there's some good thoughts in that. But listen, they don't teach that Jesus Christ saves us and cleanses us from all sin and imparts the Spirit of God to us to make us into the image of God. So, what would you rather have? The Bible or the modern gospel? Now, there are much, many more scriptures I could read that speak of the cleansing and the keeping power of the gospel. Peter, for example, wrote in 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16, But as he has called you as holy, you also be holy in a little bit of your conduct. Huh? Oh, don't throw anything at me. Let me try that again. That as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in come on, all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. All this became your dream, redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Peter mentions that in verse 19. The Apostle Paul puts the heat of the sun into this bowl of God's wrath in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As you have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, that is from Paul, let him be accursed. Paul makes a point by saying the same thing two times in a row. Paul emphasizes the magnitude of redemption in his words to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 14. He says, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. The modern gospel of the modern church is more about accepting people in their present condition than changing their moral and spiritual nature. The modern gospels are more about making people happy than making people holy. The modern gospel loves Jesus while still embracing sin. The modern gospel offers people forgiveness of their sins, but hope for victory over sin until they get to heaven. If there is no hope of victory over temptation and sin in this life, then there is no incentive to live a holy life. That's right. The modern gospel gives a Christian only two, go two options. One, do the best you can. Or two, don't even try. And how many professed Christians follow that second option, don't even try? The idea is that if you believe in Jesus, you're okay, and you're on your way to heaven, regardless of how you live. If you are a Christian... The only impact your continual, continual sinning has is to lessen your reward in heaven. But you're still going to go there. Many professed Christians comfortable with their sinning religion will reject the everlasting gospel when it tells them of the deliverance from sin. Now, that in no way implies that Christians cannot sin. Hey, we are all under the possibility of doing so if we do not follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Friends, we do not have to sin. We can be kept from sinning if we will follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. And who, my friend, would not want that? But Rejecting the everlasting gospel has a consequence. 
Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, hey, we're there, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with heaven. Now, from the faith does not necessarily mean they quit saying they're Christians. It means they do not embrace the faith of the everlasting gospel. And instead, they choose a gospel that is a lie. The expression seared with a hot iron comes from the same root word as scorch in the scripture of the fourth bowl of wrath. Continual rejection of the everlasting gospel will sear the conscience. And with a seared conscience, a person will not repent to a degree he feels he has a license to sin, although he may not call it such. So, sinning Christianity desecrates the blood of Christ and contradicts the everlasting gospel. In this sense, under this bowl of wrath, sinning Christianity blasphemes the name of God who has power over these plagues. Amen.